This is not going to be an extremely long masterclass. I just want to come bring this valuable information about proteins, about our building blocks of our bodies so we can truly understand it. All right. And the true deeper understanding of what Sebi was talking about. He knew what he was talking about. He was a biochemist. So let's keep this moving. All right. Now, let's get into folds. So when we're talking about tertiary structures, we explained different types of folds. We talked about the alpha, the beta, alpha, beta folds that happen, which is this right here. So now let's talk about other different types of folds, other three big types of main folds that happen within the body. So folds are used to classify protein structure. All right. So the first order of classification in protein structure are three different big types of folds. We got alpha folds, which we have here. We got beta folds, which we have here, which is produced more majorly from beta sheets and beta strands. And then we have alpha beta folds, which we kind of went over earlier with the beta alpha beta. All right. So this shows us a small glimpse into how many structures of cellular DNA our body really contains, because this is this, we're, as I said, granular to intercellular. So when we're talking about how, how small this is, we haven't even built a cell yet. We haven't even built a cell yet. So we have to understand how much DNA our body has. They say if you were to unravel all the DNA in the body, trillions of miles. All right. So I wanted to break this down so we can truly understand the importance of DNA and how much DNA our body really contains. So we're talking about chemical processes like hemoglobin. We're talking about cell formation that contains DNA and understanding the body's necessity for minerals and hydration to keep this DNA functioning properly. All right. So let's keep it moving. So the Rossman fold, as I've been saying, within this masterclass is an arrangement of beta strands and alpha helices. This also includes several beta alpha beta motifs as well. This is what they call Rossman fold. So this arrangement yields a six stranded parallel beta sheet that is sandwiched between different helices on each side. So beta alpha beta, beta alpha beta. We see how this structure is being built upon now don't we? All right. So this is what's a Rossman fold, the beta alpha beta structures as well. All right. So this is what goes into creating a domain. You need multiple of these different types of motifs, these different types of folds to create a domain, which is a tertiary structure. And then those tertiary structures go into create quaternary structures. All right. So another type of fold, let's get into it. An example of a mostly beta fold is carbonic anhydrase, shown here. Carbonic anhydrase catalyzes the inner conversion of carbonic acid, the result of dissolved carbon dioxide and bicarbonate, all right? It is therefore a critical enzyme for maintaining pH balance in the blood, all right? So what is this saying? <laughs> what is this saying? Because I, I, this is very important right here, family. This is very important right here. So beta folds are very essential. Beta folds are very essential, especially within the blood. All right. So carbonic anhydrase catalyzes the inner conversion of ca carbonic acid. It catalyzes the inner conversion of ca carbonic acid, which is the result of dissolved carbon dioxide and bicarbonate within the body. All right. So we all talk about carbonic acid all the time. We know acidity in the body, carbonic acid normally comes from acidic foods, which are created through the hybridization process, the genetic modification process. We understand how, bonic, how carbonic acid is created within foods and why we don't need to put more dissolved carbon dioxide within our body because that's what we're actually breathing out. That's what we don't need in our body, dissolved carbon dioxide. You get what I'm saying? So this is why that hemoglobin takes that carbon dioxide to the lungs so you can breathe it out. But it also takes that oxygen that you breathe in down to the, the blood and the rest of the cells as well. So this is a deeper level of why Seb used to say we don't need the carbonic acid within the body. Because when you, when you, when you actually think about carbonic acid and what it actually is, carbonic acid is really 
always being produced at a certain level within the body. So when we die or when a person passes, the carbonic anhydrase is no longer catalyzing. It's no longer interconverting. So this carbonic acid, it can begin to produce itself even more within the body, especially within the blood. This dissolved carbon dioxide is now what deteriorates the body. So we know once the life leaves a body, the body starts to deteriorate. The blood deteriorates the body as well as the tissues begin to decompose. This comes from the carbonic acid within the body no longer being catalyzed, no longer being balanced. And this is why the carbonic anhydrase is a very critical enzyme for maintaining pH within the blood. It maintains your natural pH of 7.4 within the blood. It keeps that carbonic acid at bay. This is the importance of the cellular membranes. It absorbs all level of acidity. You know what I'm saying? This it Sebi was a genius, bro. Like Sebi was a genius. Y'all, y'all, y'all go stop doing my elder like that, bro. Y'all gonna stop doing the elders like that. We can't, man. Sebi was way far ahead of his time, bro. Way far ahead of his time. And that's why he was so blessed how he was while he was here and did all the things that he did while he was here. I'm just breaking down to you exactly the reasons why he was so effective, why we are so effective in what it is that we do here in Cosmic Cell Foods. <laughs> biochemistry, family, biochemistry. The true understanding of biochemistry, not just talking, not just breaking stuff down that, you know, Google gives you. We're truly breaking down the true understanding. All right. So <laughs> this is carbonic acid on a deeper level. This is what carbonic acid is doing from the biochemi biochemical level. So this is why we don't need to put more additional acidity in the body. We need to, we need to eat as much oxidizing foods, as much oxygen filled foods as possible to keep the body alive, to provide oxygen to the rest of the cells for the cells to breathe. All right, let's keep it moving. So this is a beta fold. So we went over the Rossman fold, which is a combination of beta alpha beta or beta and alpha sheets coming together. That fold is called the Rossman fold. This majorly has beta sheets and what is called a beta fold. All right. And this is just an example of carbonic anhydrase, which is a beta fold. So we understand how important beta folds are to catalyzing and keeping pH balance within the body. Let's begin to truly understand, family. All right, let me keep moving because I can talk about this stuff all day. So a common alpha fold is the globin fold. Now let's get into the juicy stuff, all right? Because we're getting close to the end where I'm breaking down everything and giving you a good recap, all right? So an example is myoglobin, which is shown here. The oxygen binding protein in muscles. It releases oxygen under anaerobic conditions, which is like working out which is important during strenuous activity, like working out. So a globin fold contains eight helices and often is associated with the binding of the heme cofactor, which is mostly iron when they talk about heme. So, which is what's shown here in orange. Hemoglobin is another example of the globin fold. All right, so let's get into it, family, because I've been talking about hemoglobin this entire masterclass. All right. So the assembly of multiple polypeptides into one functional unit is called a quaternary structure of a protein. All right. We often call these individual polypeptide subunits. These subunits can have different primary structures. Here in hemoglobin, it has two subunits that are alpha hemoglobin and two subunits that are beta hemoglobin. So we often call these individual polypeptides subunits. So these are two subunits and these are two subunits which make up hemoglobin. All right. Two alpha subunits and two beta subunits. All right. So these are basically the subunits basically are the tertiary structures that come together to build quaternary structures. But within hemoglobin, the, the it has four different tertiary structures that come together to function to make the hemoglobin. And these subunits are two alpha subunits and two beta subunits, all right? So I wanted us to understand this, family. Let's understand it, all right? So the quaternary structure of hemoglobin leads to a very important, leads to very important properties that are not possible 
for monomeric proteins such as myoglobin, which is right here, meaning that the tertiary structure and below, you know, monomeric means tertiary structure and below. It can only function by itself. But hemoglobin is a quaternary structure, which is multiple tertiary structures functioning together to perform a specific duty within the body, a specific function within the body. All right. So monomeric just simply means the tertiary structure and below. You know, it can only function by itself. All right. Mono. So again, a quaternary structure is created from the combining or the synthesis of multiple tertiary structures. All right. So here in hemoglobin, abbreviated HGB or HB is the protein molecule in red blood cells that carries oxygen from the lungs to the body's tissues and returns the carbon dioxide from the tissues back to the lungs so you can breathe it out. So again, let me read that again. It is a protein molecule within the red blood cells that carries the oxygen from the lungs that, you, that you've breathed into the lungs. It carries that oxygen from the lungs to the body's tissues. And once it takes that oxygen to the body's tissues and the blood as well, it carries the carbon dioxide within the body that is, of course, catalyzed by those beta sheets. The dissolved carbon dioxide that we just explained, talking about carbonic acid, it takes that carbon dioxide and takes it back to the lungs so you can exhale it. You get what I'm saying? All right. So each globulin chain contains an important iron containing compound termed heme. So this is why when we talked about heme earlier, that's associated with globin folds. We're talking about an iron containing compound, an iron atom that is within this fold is normally termed heme. Embedded within the heme compound is an iron atom that is vital for transporting oxygen and carbon dioxide in the blood. So this is why Sebi said the lack of iron creates 40 different manifestations of disease because iron is the essential atom or the essential mineral necessary for transporting oxygen and carbon dioxide into and out of the body. So this is why iron, if you're deficient in iron, it creates 40 different manifestations of disease. Because if you if your body is not releasing that carbon dioxide, releasing that waste, releasing that acidity from the body, you will deteriorate your cells. Your cells will slowly but surely deteriorate, which creates disease. Because if we know cells are deteriorating, we know cellular membranes have been broken or the body is deficient of specific minerals which creates disease, all right? So the iron contained in hemoglobin is responsible for the red color of blood, all right? So now we even understand why blood is red. Iron is so essential, man. Bro, Sebi was so far ahead of his time, bro. He was so far ahead of this information. You got to be a biochemist to truly heal the body. You know what I'm saying? I know we see a lot of healers talking about being biochemists, but we have to truly understand the biochemistry of the body to even be able to administer herbs properly. We can truly see that Sebi was way ahead of his time. We understand that now. You truly have to understand the body. You got to understand cellular structures. We have to understand a little bit of information when it comes to the body. And it's not hard to understand this stuff. Don't make it seem like this stuff is, ooh, you know what I'm saying? Like, no. Like, this stuff is easy to understand. It's our ancient language, you know what I'm saying, that we are, should be understanding simply for, in our minds. We used to have all of this information in our minds, bro. You get what I'm saying? How you think they learned it? From us. You get what I'm saying? So we, we have to understand that with, as being carbon dense beings, how – connected we truly are to this planet how truly connected we are to this universe and all of the information that exists within it we can tap into it we have to relearn family we simply have to relearn all right so let's keep this thing moving new proteins tend to reuse existing foes as opposed to using a completely new one all right so globin foes it's already globin folding it's going to continue to globin fold 
you know, um, sometimes it will create a new fold, but most of the time it reuses the existing fold. All right. So this is why classifications of protein folds are useful. So shown here is just a few examples of roughly 1500 different folds that have been identified. This first graph shows basically the 1500 folds that have been found and it shows the time period in which it was found. The second graph here shows the progress of the structure, the structural biology over the last 40 years, which is this right here, the structures. These are the folds and these are different types of structures. These are different types of folds as well as we see how these different folds form different types of structures. So there has been over 100,000 structures that have been found over the past 40 years. And it's probably been even more since 2012. But when it comes to the actual folds themselves, there's only been about 1,500 that have been found. And it started to plateau around 2002. Um, they weren't really finding any more different types of folds. But, you know, that's off of the research that they have done. It's still a lot that they don't know, as we'll get into here in a second. The number of folds that have been determined using crystal graphs or NMR or other structural determination techniques has risen, but has actually plateaued in the last few years, as we'll see right here. Almost no new folds have been discovered. And this is in contrast to the all-time high number of protein structures that have been solved. So as we see, multiple different protein folds happen within a structure. So if we have over 1,500 different folds that can happen, we understand that multiple folds can happen Within a domain, we can understand why it's over 100,000 structures that have been found or discovered within this 40-year period. All right. So, all right, this is what Harvard says. This is one of the things that they said inside of Harvard. This is one of the things that they said. There is a lot we still don't know about protein structures, even if we know the general fold of a protein. Even though they know the general folds of proteins, they have yet to begin to fully fathom or fully break down all of the functions and structures of proteins that exist within the body. All right. A lot of the function of proteins is determined by the detail in its loops and specific side chains into how the protein functions. All right. So these loops that we talked about that can be formed due to the chemical structure or the actual physical structure. This shows how vast these loops can be used. This shows how vast these loops can be arranged to create and build multiple different protein structures. All right. So let's keep it moving. I just wanted to show you, share with y'all a little bit of information that, you know, came directly from Harvard. Even though they have a lot of valuable information, they know a lot about the body you know, anybody that's been to Harvard, this is the, the level of information that's being taught across the board. Whether you, you're you taking, you know, structural biochemistry, you're taking the building blocks to, to biochemistry, understanding folds. We understand, even if you're taking, you know, you're in school to become a doctor, you're still learning this information right here when it comes to biochemistry. You should be learning this information, you know, when it comes to biochemistry of the body as a doctor. You know what I'm saying? You should be learning biochemistry. So this is the foundational information that all doctors are being taught. All biochemists are being taught. So this is the prefaces that they are all operating on, saying that there is not much. It's still a lot that they don't know. It's still a lot that they do not know. All right. When it comes to the actual protein structures, there are a lot more structures that, that, that exist within the body that Harvard, Yale, all of them, they, they still don't know. They're still studying. You know what I'm saying? So it's now time for us to regain this, this valuable information within our mindsets because we can take it much farther as we're already doing, as you can see here. All right. If you enjoyed this video, it's a probable guarantee that you're going to like this one as well. So go ahead and give it a gander. And remember to keep it cosmic.